Welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook in association with Liftoff. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in user acquisition, monetization, and mobile game design. Hello and welcome to the Mobile Game Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. And in fact, I've just been reminded, this is our 50th episode. So, uh, so well done to us. <laughs> and if you haven't listened to all 50, um, you need to, need to have a look in your, in your podcast uh, history and, uh, and see what we've been talking about for the last uh, 49 episodes. But uh, <laughs> um, just a reminder, this is the podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. Uh, I'm your host, John Jordan, and uh, joining me today, we have two experts to dig into a particularly uh, interesting um, area. So we have... Uh, Kelly Hakalainen, who is the uh, Chief Market Analyst uh, for China at Game Refinery. How's it going, Kelly? Very good. Thanks for asking. How about you, John? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad at all. Um, 50 episodes. Wow. That uh, wow. crept up on me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. And uh, for, I think for the first time. Um, so it's always exciting to have a, have a, new, have a new expert. So we have uh, Inka Renola. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? <laughs> good. And you are another uh, Chinese market expert at uh, Game Refinery as well. So um, obviously we are talking about China and um, it's sort of hard to know where to start really with it, with uh, China, I think. Obviously being the largest mobile games market for um, quite a while, just in terms of obviously having a lot of people who play a lot of games, uh, but increasingly um, obviously is the place now where uh, games are made that are successfully globally and not just sort of in the Chinese or the Southeast Asian region. So um, uh, Kelly, you're going to kick us off, um, just give us a, sort of a, a, a top overview to sort of get our minds in, into shape around uh, the Chinese mobile games market and then we're going to drill into uh, some, some various topics um, as, as we go. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking that what makes the Chinese market so special and I really nailed it down to three major points, I think. So I would say, first of all, uh, it's like you said, John, the market is huge. They have a big domestic market that is that has a big appetite for gaming. So for example, last year, the market size was something like $45 billion. Uh, 500 million people in China play online games, uh, which translates into 52% of the population. So that's, that's quite, quite interesting numbers. And that's a huge market by any standards. And then the second point uh, is the access to capital in the, uh, in the market and access to uh, a very talented and relatively inexpensive workforce. So uh, there is money to make investments domestically as well as overseas. So that's why we see these splashy investments, 10 cents buys shares of Riot, Epic, Supercell and stuff like that. Uh, and as I mentioned, great access to relatively inexpensive labor, which then enables studios such as Mihoyo to exist that have a headcount of something like, I don't know, 4,000 employees or something like that. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, as, as the third point, I would say um, the regulations in the way that they shield the domestic market uh, from foreign games to enter the Chinese market. And I know that we're going to discuss this topic later on, um, but it was, let's just put it that way, that it has never been a very straightforward process for Western developers to enter the Chinese market and, and operate uh, their game, the game, game there. As you said, we'll discuss it. It's not always been a, the easiest place for Chinese developers either. And also, I think it's, it's good to, like people are, are a lot of times ask that, that why like, why is mobile uh, so much associated with Chinese gaming and stuff like that? So I guess uh, just giving a bit of context around that could be interesting as well. So um, concepts like games as a product, uh, boxed products and stuff like that, and console gaming in general, they never actually played a big role in China. So, and there are various reasons for that. We don't want to go there right now, uh, but things like piracy and... Uh, and the fact that console gaming was was banned for a long time in the in the in the country played a role, and the gaming population uh, just th th it it was uh, it was always exposed to free to play and and and, and mobile gaming from the from the get go get go. So there wasn't a kind of a big shift from box products or console gaming to free to play as we saw in the West. And instead, what we saw is that for for a lot of Chinese players, their first exposure to gaming was through mobile and, and, and PC. And the prevalent business model has always been free to play in, in China. And a lot of 
Chinese also live in relatively small and cramped apartments and the families are big. There's often multiple generations, generations that live under the single roof. So it's not easy to find a place where you can actually, you know, have your PC rig set up or TV console uh, set up uh, in installed. And even if you did, gaming never has been a commonly perceived, perceived as a healthy hobby. So for the underaged, that has you know, always been, they have been always forced to go outside or play secretly. And that mobile devices allow you to do that, if you understand what I mean. It's sort of the point at which mobile, free to play mobile games were sort of getting big, was also the point at which you had this sort of big, um, sort of, uh, you know, change in the, in the Chinese market as well. So you have sort of, a, you know, obviously a large population um, and a lot, you know, a very sort of strong uh, middle class developing there just at the same time when sort of the world is really getting free to play mobile and there's just no history of gaming anywhere else so you sort of have that a little bit in japan but japan would obviously be massively into consoles as well so in japan you sort of have really strong consoles not a lot of pc but a lot of mobile but it's in china just all that all that growth and all that interest in games was just pushed into free to play mobile so it's just why, why it very quickly became this enormous sort of power yes that's a good point there's definitely an uh an overlap in timelines uh there for sure so that's our sort of headline. Um, and now, uh, Inka, you're going to go into a bit bit more what's going on sort of trend-wise at the moment, which is obviously, yeah, give us some detail. Yeah, so about a bit oral market first. So it's still very, like, Tencent the net is dominated market. And mid-core is still a big thing. But actually, interestingly, um, the casual has been on the rise right now. So it's like um, last year, uh, mid-core lost 7% of the revenue market share and casual actually grew 4% and also casino like 2%. And um, there's like a lot of different interesting things in the casual uh, that has been affecting this. Um, and one of the most interesting is the game called Eggy Party. Um, it's this stumble guys type of game, which has very deep social experience also. Like for example, um, you can walk into a shop and see other players at the same time there. And um, uh, Eggy Party was actually like third biggest on the Q2. And it's like grown into this whole big thing within a year. So that's um, drawing a lot of casual players in. Um, and uh, in addition to that game, there are also a lot of other like um, casual games that are interesting. Um, uh, for example, there's one merch game called Fat Goose Gym. That's like merch games are not very common in China, but that has been very popular. Um, and generalize, there's also like a lot of interactive story games that have been published. Um, well, not. Well, quite recently, but like there's coming new interactive story games every now and then. So it's definitely growing. And also there's this cozy game thing. And it's also like in China because there's this one tycoon game called Tao Yuan Xian Chu Yorentia, which um, is this very beautiful water painted uh, soothing game where you manage a village somewhere in the fantasy world and it's this very cozy and soothing and nice uh, gameplay experience. Um, and also like feature wise, uh, there's interesting stuff happening like limited time gotchas, bulk gotcha discounts, they have all like become more popular and there's big difference between like top 20 games and other games. So it's like the overall idea is this like more casual. I think. When you say cozy games, that's more that's like a genre of sort of um, a style of game. Yeah, I think that's also like a Western thing. <laughs> like, like in general, people like to have these kind of cozy games, and apparently, China has also this kind of um, thing happening. That some people want to play these more chill games, not so like stressful. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add on on the uh, Inga mentioned about the socialness of the of the game, and if you look at the the um, basically all the top games in China, but also the casual games. Uh, we mentioned Eggy which is obviously entirely based on a social experiences. You, Inga mentioned the social hub that is there and you can create your own home there, decorate it, invite friends to come over, uh, decorate the home with them um, and engage in all kinds of social activities uh, in the game uh, uh, with, your, with your friends. 
and also uh, the Fat Goose Gym game that you mentioned, the, the merch game. Well, one of the things, there's actually a lot of interesting aspects in, in that game, because in the West, the merch to genre has been a little bit of, how should I put it, and stagnant in the sense that um, we haven't seen large feature evolutions in, in the genre. Um, and I'm not saying Fat Goose Gym is doing anything super wild there, but what they have there uh, is, for example, a chat function. They have friend lists and send ask features, which are something that we haven't seen in the top, uh, top crossing merge two game. So that just tells about um, the Chinese developers and their emphasis on the social aspects of games. So no matter the genre, they are thinking how we can add social elements into the game, uh, which obviously, like we all know, is a huge um, sort of a weapon for you to utilize if you think about retention and how to make your players stick to your game and stuff like that. So, so they are definitely masters of that. Uh, Chinese people especially love social aspect in the games, but of course it's like uh, in Western games it has become also like more popular to have some kind of social elements and maybe it has something to do with China having them a lot, so we don't know. Mobile apps in general are, are much more um, sort of sophisticated in that respect in, in, in terms of China. So people in the West, like everyone says, oh, people spending too too long on their mobile phones or on Instagram or something like that. But obviously in China, you sort of have these, you know, sort of we'll see what Elon Musk manages to do with X. But, um, but this idea of sort of like everything apps. So you have you have these sort of apps that are sort of like Facebook, Twitter, shopping, all all merged into one, don't you? So so I, I guess in in general that that audience just sort of expects a sort of a a, a more sort of sophisticated um, experience from just it being a game that you have your game friends in. I mean, the, the people are just much more I think used to sort of sharing that sort of stuff. At least that, that's my sort of impression. Yeah, that, that's a good point. There are a lot of experience, like gay games, gaming experiences in China that, like you said, they offer under one roof, as to say, they offer a lot of different kinds of experiences. So just to give you an example, like you have um, like, a, like Honor of Kings, Kings, which we all know is a MOBA game, but you can have, you know, a Fall Guys mode there. You can have an auto chess mode there and stuff like that. Uh, or QQ Speed, which is a Mario Kart racer, but but then you can have a dancing game mode there. You can have that um, Among Us mode there and, and stuff like that. So um, they're very quick to look at what's trending, uh, not only in China, but also in the West, and then um, add those elements that they see trending to their own games. And it doesn't matter if the core genre or the core loop in the game has anything to do with that trend that they're looking at. So that's that's also, that's always very, very interesting to see when, when those things happen. Yeah, and um, also like the addition of something else in the core game is like the thing. Like for example, in, in the Fat Goose Gym that you mentioned and I mentioned before, it's a merge game, but there is this menu where you can access like multiple different mini games. So you will never get bored because you have like if you're bored with the merge game, then you can play some other type of game mode at the same time. And I think the new games now have like added even more of that stuff than before. And there's also this new MMORPG called Justice, and that one also has like a really social wall where you can like see where your game friends right now are doing whatever they are doing inside the game. So I think they're like thinking about it even more than before. So obviously, you know, you talk about games, which, which the, I guess the translation or the transliteration of sort of something like Eggy Party or something like sort of fast, <laughs> Fat Goose Gym obviously sounds sort of funny in a sort of maybe different way to us. But in terms of in China, does something like Fat Goose Gym, does that, I mean, is, is that just like a translation of of those words or does it sort of in China, does that, does that seem like a, you know, like in English, Stumble Guys is sort of like it. Sometimes they have their own translation name, but sometimes we just need to put it in action <laughs> by ourselves and it might sound a bit silly. <laughs> yeah, because I'm wondering, like, there may be phrases in Chinese which the, sort of the game title plays off of, which would sort of make sense to a Chinese audience, whereas for us it just sounds like, you know, no one, no one here would release a game called Fat Goose Gym, or I don't, I don't sort of think they would do that. Cause it's... I know that Eggy Party, at least, is their, the official name that they use, but actually with Egg, uh, Fat Goose Gym, uh, I'm not 100% sure, was it one of our analysts that 
that made it up or did we look it up for somewhere that's that's actually something that i'm not 100 percent sure <laughs> okay um so in terms of um sort of it, from, from what you're saying there it was interesting that sort of mid-core which is chinese and sort of asian markets have always been very um you know sort of focused on because that monetizes is better and i guess maybe if that's going down a little bit that maybe is the market sort of expanding um uh, a, a little bit do you think is, is that a can we make that as a broad trend or is, it, is that am i am i um sort of making stuff up there so you mean that the market expanding beyond mid-core to are people playing less mid-core and moving on to these other things or is or is i mean is it just maybe i imagine over time sort of more more people who wouldn't call themselves gamers sort of eventually end up playing games so you sort of have a sort of you know a widening of the audience but maybe becoming less concentrated in the sort of more core elements the way i see it is that um i think um we as players we at times we might be motivated by different kinds of things so if we think about games like like i mentioned that a qq speed um has or maybe maybe a mid-core game is a better example so if if uh, honor of kings has an you know casualish uh, game mode in there i think um a lot of people don't mind uh, like playing that casualist game mode even if it happens inside a uh, mid-core game i think there's uh even especially these big games that have like what tens of millions of, of players there's so much different kinds of player types and so much different kinds of motivations to play the play the games um that um th a lot of them might have additional you know motivations and and um appetites for for the game genres in addition to let let's say the moba gameplay in in honor of kings so i i don't i think that's just sort of like uh um adding more value to 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 these players and 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 giving something that they they can you know feed the, their their specific motivations that they might have. So so, so I, I guess that's that's what, how I, I think about that. And uh, in addition, I think that it might have something to do with the same thing as in the West. That like um, uh, the gender who play the games have also diversified. So maybe earlier it might have been more like male dominated thing, and then it's like more female players and well, often they play, for example, those interactive story games or customization games or something else casual. So there's like a need for those genres to... Yeah, that's a good point. I think it, it was uh, researched some, some time ago that um, the demographics, for example, for Honor of Kings was... The, 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 the percentage of female players was, was, was really high, it was like close to... 50% or something like that. So that that was really like su surprising. So 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 um, no wonder that um, they're also looking for um, um, serving that kind of demographic. Briefly, Honor of Kings is like a mobile MOBA. It's effectively sort of a League of Legends type type, type game, isn't it? Um, um, so yeah, so that's a yeah. It is a, that would be an interesting point of view if, if it was that audience was sort of had a wider demographic because you have these games which are sort of about one thing but have all these other things in there then that's a sort of more interesting audience whereas it was striking you know it's striking that i don't think you know in the west i don't know i mean it's probably culturally that if you had a, a shooter game and then put a, a merge in there i mean the, the fan base would be you know and maybe this is me putting too um you know, too much sort of stress on the point but it seems to me maybe that sort of western audiences treat the treat the sort of coherence of the game as that's sort of quite important if you have a game the sort of the game needs to make sense you know you can do weird things in the game but there needs to be some sort of reason why you're doing weird things in the game whereas i think if asian markets not just for china it doesn't matter if you've got a shooter game and you put a you know a merge game in there if, if everyone likes it you just well, that's fine because we'll get on with it yeah but then on the other hand in the west we're seeing a lot of hybrid games and and we have things like puzzle rpgs that you know combine mid-core elements to certain kind of casual elements and, and, and other examples like this. So, but yeah, I, I get your point. Maybe in the West, it's, it wouldn't be that easy in a way to, to pull that kind of thing off. I think for a live game, you, you, you'd probably find the core audience. The core audience generally get very moany about things they don't feel are part of the core experience. And anyway, let's move on. Um, so I guess one of the other sort of big trends over the last um, probably f well, maybe five years, more than that, but is, is sort of previously 
Chinese were very good at making games for sort of China, Southeast Asia, maybe Japan, Korea. Um, but we've really seen now, I guess, you know, Chinese games be very successful globally. Um, and then obviously Chinese developers sort of co-developing or, be, be, you know, having access to IP like Harry Potter and Diablo and all those sort of things. And, and really that that's sort of been, I think, quite a big change um, to my mind that Chinese games are, as, you know, are as big globally as they are in China. Do you think that's a sort of fair, fair assessment? Is that a big trend, or am I, am I overseeing that? Uh, Chinese games not being so big. No, they are so big now. Pre previously, you sort of had, had had Chinese games tended just to be big in Southeast Asia or China or those areas. Whereas now, I think you know Diablo clearly was. There's lots of sort of um, discussion around that game and how how grindy it was going to be. But I think most people just think you know, Diablo Immortal is a really good game. That's my impression of it, at least. So it didn't really the fact that it was made by a Chinese developer, and obviously, Call, you know, uh, Call of Duty, Chinese developer. I mean, almost like all the big, <laughs> all, all the big IP games now. Yeah, I think there's been a definite uh, change that we see a lot, a lot of more China originated games in 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 the West and globally uh, as well. So if you look at, for example, the forex strategy space in the West, it's all China games. Uh, really, it's dominated by them. Uh, we see their they have a big presence in genres like RPGs, in, in shooters, and um, where I think the next sort of like big move is going to be is, is going to be in casual. So we're all already seeing some signs of that uh, in, in, in Match 3, for example, like Project Makeover is, is uh, made by Magic Tavern that's, that has origins in, in, in China and games like Gossip Harbor by, by Microfun and, and, and stuff like that. So. So um, yeah, I think their presence is just gonna get bigger. Um, so one thing we sort of headlined at the at the start was was um, Chinese regulation. So I don't know how how much detail you want to go in on that one because that could sort of be a podcast in and of itself, all the changes that have happened. But uh, <laughs> actually, how do you want to how do you want to inform us about the Chinese regulation of mobile games and the impact that has? Yeah, I, I think this is as you said. This could be there. It's its own uh, podcast, and definitely I'm not the 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 experts out there when it comes to this topic. But it's always been an interesting one, and and definitely as a China analyst, you get exposed to this stuff. Um, but I guess uh, what I want to just go through is the different types of regulations that are there, because that's also sometimes a bit confusing. People talk about regulations, but what do they actually mean? So, so obviously, we, there, there's regulations on um, the market entries for Western developers to China. So, so you need this, that special license to enter the market. Um, and may maybe some of the listeners might know that there were several years when no li licenses were given uh, to Western games. But now, in the in the last year or, or, or year or two, these regulations have been slowly being uh, eased eased off. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, that there are regulations on children's playtime and money spent. Um, so how they are tackling this is with different kinds of login credential uh, requirements and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, according to the, some of the reports and research uh, that I found, um, apparently the restrictions can be pie-bassed quite easily. And actually, when minors playtime has been researched after these regulations have been implemented, um, there hasn't really been a any sort of uh, major decline in, in, in minors' um, playtime. So, so it might be that these uh, regulations haven't maybe worked as well as they were initially planned to work. And then third one is regulations on the content of the games. So um, China being China, there are things you need to consider when it comes to, for example, content on uh, LGBTQ content, for example, or or you cannot criticize certain things about China in, 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 in games and, and also uh, about uh, sexual topics and stuff like that. So um, that's also a bit different when it comes to operating in, in the West, obviously. And then uh, monetization reg re regulations. And one thing that comes to my mind is straight away, for example, that starting from, I think it was 2017, all the games uh, have had to disclose their gotcha drop rates, for example, uh, in the in the game. So there's there's a lot of different types of uh, regulations. So when people talk about regulations, it's 
always good to clear up the what kind of regulations are, are they actually uh, meaning. Are there any notable sort of Western developed games that are doing well in China um, these days? There are some, but there are like, um, there's a clear uh, sort of like change that has happened. I've worked here for seven years, like following closely the Chinese market. And when I started, it was very common for Western de developers to have the same game with the same game ID that they have in the West in China as well. So whenever there was an update to the game, it was, you could always rely that it was, this, you know, it's the same build, the same ID, the same update, the same content. Of course, they still could, you know, have the texts in the game, copywriting, translating and stuff like that. But it was, it was the same build, the same game. But that has completely changed in uh, like, I think the change happened like three or four years ago. Nowadays, uh, you have all the Western games that we see in the China, let's say Supercell games or Playrixis games and stuff like that. They operate with their own IDs. They usually have uh, the partner company that they're cooperating with. Maybe it's NetEase, maybe it's Tencent, maybe it's something else. That is, if you look at the publisher of the game, that's usually the publisher of the game. And they might, ha they might have been not only translated, but really like localized, maybe the live ops, the monetization has been localized to a much greater extent than what they, what the differences were like seven years ago. So th th there has been a clear shift um, when it comes to that. And you asked what, are, like, what kind of games there are. Yeah, the, the, there's a couple of Supercell games. Uh, Inka, you can actually correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Clash of Clans is in the top 200. We have Brawl Stars there. Then we have Homescapes, Gardenscapes, and um, I think does something else come to your mind? No, the, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and, and one thing to note is that it, it, the number of these games dec has been decre decreasing all the time. Now it's very interesting times to look at like how things will evolve now that new licenses are given also to Western developers. We will, will we see new Western originated games, you know, getting into the top 200 or is it going to stay the same? Yeah, I mean, I certainly re remember when sort of Supercell started launching there, it was sort of seen as a very, very big thing. I guess that was sort of the peak of when the Chinese market was more open and, and, and I think, yeah, it's been downhill since then. Uh, but actually, that did remind me of one, one thing we have sort of mentioned in passing a couple of times, and it may be good to sort of go into a bit more detail. So we do mention Tencent and NetEase as sort of the two big companies in, in China. Can you can you give some idea of just how big they are? Because it's, it's not like it's not like we'd say, oh, Activision and EA are quite big in the West, but there's sort of, you know, quite a lot of other ones as well. I mean, I, I don't know the exact figures, but they are just enormously bigger than anything else, aren't they? I mean, they are sort of, sort of a, a duopoly. Yes. And it, like, it's, it's a very drastic difference, especially if you compare to the Western market, which is much more fragmented. If you just look at the, let's say, top 200 grossing games, you look at the publisher, if you had an, you know, Excel, CSV output of the publishers of the two S uh, top 200 games, you would see a lot more fragmented, you know, um, uh, chart of the, of the public uh, publishers, but then in China, um, Netis and Tencent have a huge, huge market share of the, of the top 200 games. I don't have, uh, any exact numbers to throw, throw at you right now that what is the exact percentage number, but, but the, the difference is. It's like night and day if you compare Western and, and Chinese market. I also recall that Honor of Kings takes like really big market share of overall revenue. So and it's the top one game. So yeah, I mean, I think at one point it was doing was it 100 million DAUs or something? I think maybe it's dropped a little bit since then. But this, <laughs> yeah, it was the biggest the biggest game in the world on any platform by yeah miles. Yeah, an interesting thing is there's all like it's still I think like in the top 10 downloads. Like even it's like a seven well i don't know seven eight years old, old old game so yeah people just they i guess they churn out for a bit little bit and then they reinstall the game and it's always in the in the top so but yeah interesting good um okay so um we've had a look at sort of where we are and a bit of the past um how do we how do we see that see the future um in the chinese market what, what sort of products are going to be there is it you know any significant changes or is it going to be sort of just continuing the sort of the, the, the gradual upward peak that we've seen when comes to Chinese publisher, I think they, like I, I mentioned this already, but they most likely will try to gain even more foothold in the West because the, the Chinese domestic market, it is, of course, all the markets are, I, 
highly competitive, but the, the Chinese market fiercely so. Uh, and the Western markets are very, very attractive for uh, Chinese companies. And um, one of the reasons why we, like we mentioned the, the acquisitions that they've, they've made and, and stuff like that. So I, I see them as an active player in the West in the future as well. I already mentioned that they are, I think the next big moves are gonna happen in the casual uh, space. And, and one interesting um, example of that is Microfun. Um, I mentioned this already as well. So they operate the game Gossip Harbor, but they have several other merch games uh, uh, as well. Some of them are merch three games, some of them are merch two games, but they have a clear portfolio strategy uh, a strategy uh, there where they cross prom promote inside one app, the other app, so that you get rewards uh, in the app that you're playing if you download the other app and do certain kind of tasks there. So they're definitely like uh, trying to move their players across their portfolio games uh, and then increase the overall value of their uh, portfolio that way, uh, which um, uh, apparently is not I get, I'm not like, let's put it this way. I'm not sure if it's 100% something that you actually are allowed to do in a, in a sense, uh, in the West, I mean, um, but um, but yeah, that's something that me, the, the microphone is doing. And I, I, I think that the things like these strategies like these uh, will be something that um, the Chinese publishers will definitely uh, uh, Con, con, uh, consider and then uh, just regarding on MNA, MNA, I think that like in the future, they most likely will be challenged by uh, the Saudi money. Uh, we're already seeing some big moves from, from for example, Savvy that bought Scopely and stuff like that. So in the future, with the MNA things going on, um, I think they're gonna get more expensive for Chinese companies to engage in just because of, of the fact of the, of the competition of the investments also, also uh, getting higher. Of course, the macro, on macro level now, the, the overall M&A market has sort of like cooled down a little bit, but in the like, in longer term, I, I, I do think that it, it's not gonna be so easy for them for various kinds of reasons for to, to, to engage in that strategy as well. I would like to also add that I, I think that um, because there's a lot of these West, um, Chinese games that have been like published in the Western market, but they're exactly the same. And sometimes it doesn't work because it's it's maybe a bit more like Chinese taste. So I guess that they will get better at kind of localizing them to the Western market in the future because you know younger people are maybe understand better how to do that kind of localization. So I believe that they will get better at that. It's almost like the reverse of what you're saying, Kelly, where West, to begin with, Western developers were putting just their normal game into Chinese markets and then hoping it did well. And maybe for the last few years, Chinese developers will be just putting their Chinese game into Western markets and hoping it does well. But actually they'll realize, well, the game we have for China, it's a good game, but we need to just sort of, you know, maybe some subtle differences or, you know, maybe some more substantial differences over time, you know, is a way to, to sort of uh, optimize that for different markets. Um, uh, certainly, yeah, the, the, the taste of Western gamers is, is still quite different to Chinese and Asian um, gamers. So, so, so maybe maybe the, it'll be the reverse the reverse trend that they'll be they'll be learning from that way. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Calais and uh, Inca, um, and I hope you enjoyed that. So uh, every episode now will be episode fifty one, I guess. Next, wow. Um, uh, we're talking about what's going on in the in the world of uh, mobile gaming, um, and there's just you know an awful lot going on. Very dynamic very you know very big markets and these sort of big companies coming in and it's always changing so i uh, hope you subscribe uh via your podcast uh channel of choice or or, or by the video um now now we're doing video so um thanks for watching listening and uh, come back next time see you then goodbye mm -hmm.